You are listening to the Freedom Fellowship audio podcast from Freedom Fellowship Church in Tontytown, Arkansas. Our mission is to love God, love others, and serve both. And now let's listen in to this week's sermon. I don't know how many of you have seen this. If you've been up, uh, pulled up behind a car at a stoplight or on the back of an SUV, a lot of times you see this deal. So we got palm trees and, you know, sometimes they're a little beach thing. And then it says, no bad days, no bad days. But I don't know who those people are. But I'll tell you what, it isn't anybody I know. Because about anybody I can think of, or everybody I can think of, frankly, if I know you very well, I know that you have some bad days, as do I. Well, see, Friday's odd, because if you think about it, Friday they call Good Friday. And so you think, whew, you think about the violence, and, and you just kind of go back, and if you, you know, in this video you saw some of the discussion. We tried to be kind of careful not to be too graphic, but, I mean, that was a hard day for Jesus, all the things he was going through. And I thought to myself, well, you know, what's good about that Friday? If you looked in your U version that some of you may follow at the top of it, even I even titled this, Man, I Hate Fridays. Now, most of us, if we work, we think, well, I don't hate Fridays. That's the weekend. But when you put it in this context, you think, wow, that was a tough day. On that day, Jesus was tried. He was found guilty by a screaming mob. He was tortured. He was put to death on the cross at Calvary. So palm trees or not, I tell you what, it'd be hard to, to tell them no bad days. Because that was a tough day. But see, today we commemorate a different day. We commemorate a day not as Easter, but we commemorate a different kind of day. Now, if I went out and caught people on the street and I asked them a question, I said, now, tell me, when you think about Easter, what is the mental image you have of Easter? And I'll give you some ideas of things that I think you might typically hear. Well, Easter, it's, that's the time when springtime happens and flowers in bloom. It's just a great time of the year in the Ozarks. Well, you know, Easter, well, a lot of times if the weather's nice, we do picnics. Those are wonderful, just picnics. Or maybe it's the Easter bunny we talk about. Or maybe it's the Easter egg hunt that the kids are going to do after a while. Maybe it's a day that we get dressed up for church. Back when I was a kid, the big deal was that, you know, they had the Easter bonnets. So you couldn't see the preacher because everybody had these big hats on in front of you. But it was, it was a time when people would dress up. And a lot of times, that's also the day of family picture. We have a, a picture place out here in the East Lobby. So there were just a lot of things that went on. Some people say, well, that's the time when people most often go to church. You know, when they're more heavily attended. And then for some of us that like the river and the lakes, you know, that's the time that fish bite a little better. So there's a lot of things we think about, but the reality is what we're here today for is what? We're here today because this is Resurrection Day, right? That's what we showed up for. It's Resurrection Day. That's what believers celebrate today. Now, Friday, if you just kind of roll yourself back into that time, Friday had to be been a miserable day for the followers of Jesus. I mean, they'd been hooked up tight for him for these three years, and, and they had all this stuff going on, and they knew that they were their role was to be servants, and I mean, they're just, they're just completely involved in this ministry. But it's see that what they didn't have, it just, it's obvious when you read scripture that they didn't really have a grasp of what Jesus was telling him. He was foretelling the resurrection. You heard us talk about that when Mike and I were talking a while ago in the, in the tape. But he was foretelling the resurrection. But see, they were distraught, and they were wondering about what's going to happen now. So you know, they, they, there's an old deal. If you want to, if you want to slow down people, you you take care of their leader. Well, that's in essence what they did. So when you think about that, hi, Kalen, by the way, good to see you. When you think about that, one of the things that happens is that that people they do they get discouraged, they get distraught, just at the very nature of what was going on. It had to be a tough day for them. And so here comes Sunday now, because Saturday, I mean, they're they're. They're wondering what's going to do. Now, let me tell you another thing that I think most of us would have been. So we watched the leader of our group be tortured and taken up and crucified on a cross. Now, I can tell you, not very many of them went to Calvary with him. You know, Scripture says there were a few that were up there, his mother and some. But for many of them, I tell you what they were thinking. They were thinking, am I next? 
And so, I mean, there's all, these, all this emotion and all this feeling that's going on, and they're wondering, what, what's in store for us now? Jesus is gone. But come Sunday morning, there's some ladies, and they go to the tomb. And what they had done is they had gone to the tomb because the body was put away hastily so they would not interrupt Sabbath. And so they put the body hastily in the tomb, had sealed it up with a stone, sealed it literally, and had Roman guards that were there because the last thing they wanted was for anybody to be able to say, oh, hey, look, he really did get resurrected. And so they were watching him closely. And, you know, when they went there, they found what? They found out that his body was gone. And so, you know, what we hear is, I, I love the statement that the angel made. It's in Scripture in Luke. And this is a Scripture. He says, so why do you look for the living among the dead? Some of your scriptures may say, why do you look for the living in a graveyard? Because he went on, the angel did, said, because he's risen. He's not here. So that very day, Jesus began to appear to his followers. Now, in Acts, Luke writes this, at the very, in the first chapter of Acts, where he's talking, you know, Jesus is, this is post-Jesus now, when you get into the book of Acts. And this is what he writes in, in the first chapter of Acts. He said, he, being Jesus, presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs. In other words, he proved it a lot of different ways. Appearing to them during the 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. So listen to the list of recorded appearances. And there, there would be more appearances, but let me just kind of tick off a number that you can pick out if you go through your scriptures of the appearances that happened between Resurrection Day, the Sunday we're talking about, today the anniversary of, and 40 days from now, when Jesus would be taken up into the heavens. So Mary Magdalene was in the garden. She mistaken him for a gardener. You can go read that. And he says, and she finally realized by his voice, oh, that's the Savior. Then there was Mary and, and Salome and Joanna and the other Mary. And they went to the tomb, of course, and didn't find him. But later they would understand who he was, that they would see Peter had a personal encounter with him. Cleopas and a, a companion, if you if you remember, there was, a, there was a, a guy who just joins these two guys walking on the road to Emmaus, and when he joined them, you know, that he started talking about, well, what's, what's up, what's up? And they described to him what was going on and, and the loss of Christ. And he went and spent the day with them, and they, they thought, oh, look who we ran into. Then there was the 11 disciples minus Thomas. There were 11 disciples plus Thomas, or including Thomas. And then there were the, the disciples who were out fishing. You may remember if you read some Bible stuff, you may remember they fished all night. They didn't do any good. He said, put your net over on the right-hand side. And they thought, okay, who's this guy yelling at us from the shore? You know, like, you a fisherman? So he, you know, sure enough, they bring up a, a net that's so full they can't even lift it out and into the boat. And then they have a guy that says, come on over. And guess what? It turns out it's Jesus. And he cooks breakfast for them and feeds them there on the shoreline. And then we know that the disciples and others gathered. These are, again, remember what these are. These are, these are the things that occurred in those 40 days after the resurrection that, that the disciples point to to make their case. And so we know that the disciples and others gathered on a mountain to listen and he appeared to 500 in that occasion. And then at the very end, he's at the Mount of Olives. And that's where Jesus gives the Great Commission. This is what it says in Matthew 28. He said, then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but they doubted. Then Jesus came to them and he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. And oh, by the way, that's our job, right? Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always. You know, we saw baptism today, just right out of these scriptures. We saw that occurrence, that happening. So the book of Acts then records Jesus then after that ascending, after the Mount of Olives, it records him ascending literally to heaven to be with his father. 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. Let me read just a few verses. Now, okay, you've been in here a while. you got stuff in your belly, so 
Don't go to a malaise. Listen to the scripture because this is really good stuff I'm getting ready to tell you here, okay? This isn't me. This is the gospel writers presenting this. So listen to what's said. 15th chapter, it says, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. In other words, they received it, and they had taken their stand as disciples. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. In other words, you have believed, so otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you at the first, of first importance. And, he's, and now he's going to talk about the things he said. It's important that you know this. So this is what he says. He said, but it passed on to you of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. And he did that. And that he was buried, and he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. And he, and he appeared to Cephas, Peter, and then to the twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the other brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and at last, he appeared to me also as to one unborn. Now, you may say, well, what's that? That sounds kind of confusing. But if you remember... Paul really wasn't in the presence of Jesus. But what he was, he was on the road to Damascus to go, uh, to literally go and arrest Christians and persecute them, bring them back for trial. When Jesus said to him from the heavens, Saul, Saul, later Paul, why do you persecute me? So that's what he's really talking about. He said, you know, I, I, I didn't get to see him in the flesh, but believe me, when you had the encounter I had on the Damascus road, I know who this guy is. Now, the American court system, the American court system, what, they, what prosecutors want to have is they want to have somebody who's an eyewitness to the situation. They want somebody who literally laid their eyes on the suspect or whatever it is they're trying to prosecute, but they really want that eyewitness. Now, there's a phrase in law in Latin. Oh, did I ever tell you, Harrison, I took Latin in high school? Yep, I did. Now, it hadn't used, I haven't been able to use it much because I didn't really do very well. But I do remember one thing that was in my Latin book, just so you know, yeah. Well, it was written by a student. It wasn't part of the textbook. It was written by a student, and I remember, I mean, this is the only thing I remember for sure, but in the back it said, Latin killed the Romans and Latin's killing me. <laughs> so I can't profess, but I can tell you that in the Latin, I looked it up, and in the Latin, there's a word called habeas corpus. Now, habeas corpus means just literally, show me the body. Habeas corpus, show me the body. So Paul, he makes the point that these people I'm talking about, these people we just read about in 1 Corinthians, and that we had this conversation about in the first part of Acts, these people saw the body. They saw the man. They saw him after he had been put to death, had a spear in his side, taken to the tomb, and then they saw him over these next 40 days. All these people from the day of the resurrection over the next 40 days, they physically saw Jesus. And at least one we know touched him. Who was it? Thomas. Do you remember that? If you read your Bible, Thomas was one because this is what it says in John, the 20th chapter. It says, this is Jesus. He says, Thomas was what? What did they call him, by the way? What was his nickname? Doubting Thomas. Yeah, okay, that's okay. Not me. So he said this. He said, put your finger here. See my hands. Now reach out and put your, put your hands into my side. And then stop the doubting and believe. Okay? I did a crummy job of reading that, okay? But I hope you got it and I hope you're reading it behind me. Because what he was saying is, okay, you're, you're a doubter. You, you doubted me. Now, I'm going to prove who I am. I want you to come up here. I want you to look at these nail scars in my hand. Now reach over here, and I want you to put your hand here in my side where the guy, where the Roman soldier ran his spear up, clear up to my heart. So Thomas did that. He said, then stop doubting and believe. Now, what, they're, what we're establishing today is this wasn't a rumor. This Christian process it wasn't a fairy tale. But Paul said, what I presented to you, I presented to you supportive evidence to show you that Jesus was real and the resurrection was real. 
Jesus died on the cross, he said. He said he's risen from the grave. He's been taken up into the heavens. And he said, and I can vouch for the fact that I know, based on scripture, that he sits on God's right hand. He said, those are the things I know. So see, we have these, rever these references to help us understand that Jesus rising on the third day, that wasn't, that, you know, that wasn't a surprise to God. I mean, you know, sometimes people think, well, you know, this just seems like that you, he woke up every day and decided what to do. These were not surprises. Let me just dial you back a thousand years, and we go back to the Psalms, and the psalmist writes this in Psalm 16. He said, the body of the Holy One, that's Christ, the body of the Holy One will not be corrupted. That's a thousand years before Jesus was on this earth. 300 years later, still 700 years before him, what we read in Isaiah, we read a graphic detail. This is in Isaiah 53, if you want to go back about 12 verses. But it's a graphic detail of exactly what was going to happen to Jesus as far as the crucifixion and being arrested and being beaten. But, I mean, this is 700 years before the fact. I hope that each one of us that are believers realize that salvation, which is believing in our heart and it's confessing with our mouth, that we see the resurrection, this story, as a picture of what's waiting for us. The difficult thing is this, that we can, we can have head knowledge and we can understand that, okay, so there's Jesus, okay. You know, he was here in, in life, and we think about the crucifixion and the death and the resurrection. But I tell you what, the, the longest 15 inches of life is trying to figure out how to get that from your head to your heart. Because believe me, we have a lot of believers, quote unquote, that they still are wrestling with the head knowledge, but they haven't figured out that unless I drive it to my heart and that changes my life, and I accept a personal relationship with Christ, what have I done? Because we're called to have a personal relationship, and a personal relationship doesn't come from your head. It comes when it penetrates your heart and it creates attitude change. Thank you. But see, if, and I've thought about this quite a bit. I've said it I, even when Kimberly and I were talking about it, but a lot of times what we think about, we talk about eternal life. Okay? And we think about eternal life, and eternal life is like, I don't know about y'all, but I've always kind of thought, well, it's somewhere out there. But think about it this way. If you're a believer, if you're a Christian, your eternal life has already started. Right? Because there, there may, in fact, we're going, we're going to have this, I don't know, I guess I call it a, a transition, because there's going to be a time, all of us do it, but there's going to be a time in our life when it's, our time is done here on earth, and, we're, and we moved up there, okay, that we go from here to there. There's this transition that occurs. And for sometimes, it's not even very pleasant. It's a little time. But, but if you think about this, listen to this. If you're, if you're thinking about this eternal life process, what we have in this transition, and really if you think about it in the range of eternity, this transition we're going to make is a brief moment in time. But then we get to be with the Father full time. Isn't that a great deal? We get to be with the Father full time as a result of that transition. But if you're a believer, your eternal life, grasp it, your eternal life has already started. All you got somewhere along is you're going to have some bump in the road, and then you have just glory looking you right in the face. It'd be a place with no more tears, no more sorrows, no more broken relationships, no more uncashed dreams. We won't have cancer around anymore. We won't have abuse. We won't have abortion. We won't have sin. I'm telling you, it's going to be a great place to be. Now, some of us here today, and I'm not naive, and I know this to be true, some of us here today, you're in a very tough spot. Okay? Some of you here today, you're in a very tough spot. But see, so... What happens, and I'm going to use this kind of metaphorically, but what happens is when we get caught in this Friday kind of life, go back and remember what I was thinking about. Remember, we're going to get caught in this Friday kind of life, and it seems like when we're in that Friday kind of life, you know, things are just pretty messed up. 
you know, a lot of times they don't seem, you know, they're not fair. You know, I, I, I just, I'm struggling with these relationships and I don't get treated fairly and, you know, just all that stuff happens. And, you know, I, I just this Friday that I'm in and in this situation, I just feel hopeless. Are things going to get any better? And see, that infamous Friday was necessary for Christ. It wasn't a surprise to God because he knew what would happen is Jesus was going to have to come. He was going to have to come here on earth. He already knew that he was going to die for our sins because the only way with that sacrifice that with anything would be better is for Jesus to die for us because he knew that we were fallible, sinful people by our very nature. Now, life for any of us won't be no bad days, okay? That's where we started. Life for any of us will not be no bad days. It'd be a great thing. I'd love to be able to just take somebody and, 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 just, and just inoculate them, just give them a shot and just say, okay, you know, you're a Christian now and there's no bad things. Life is going to be great. But the reality is that even the relationship we have with Christ, it's not going to inoculate you from bad things happening in life because this isn't heaven. This is the world that we live in that we, that, we, that we try to navigate through to the best of our ability. But if you see, if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth, let me say it again, if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord of your life, and I'm not talking about in your head, I'm saying you gotta drive it down that 15 inches to your heart. But if you believe and confess it, scripture says very plainly, can't be easier than this, you'll be saved. That's what it says. You'll be saved. Now, what I can tell you is that your Sunday is coming. Even if you sit here today and life's not perfect and you got tough stuff going on, I'm telling you that your Sunday, if you're a believer, your Sunday is coming away from the bad Fridays. Now, our rebirth in Jesus Christ I tell you what, I'm just going to. This, there's a lot of stuff, just wonderful stuff that happens. But I'm going to tell you just a few things. Your relationship in Christ paves the way for a few things to happen. Let me just mention a few. One is you can be secure in your salvation. I don't know how many people that I talk to in life, and we're talking about salvation, and they say, "Well, I hope I go to heaven." I'm thinking, I hope you do too. But the reality is, if you if you've confessed with your mouth, you've believed in your heart. And it's an attitude change, not just a, something you did to satisfy a mother or grandmother or spouse. Then the reality is, you don't have to wonder. It tells us that our salvation is sealed, and we are, in fact, a child of the king. We have eternal life to look forward to. Now, the other thing it does is this creates a relationship that can start to heal relationships here on earth. Because all of a sudden, when we decide that we're going to put Christ first and we're going to follow him, and it's not about me, it's about him and my role in life as a servant. That's what Jesus spent all his time telling these disciples, right? He told them, he said, you're a servant. You're not the boss of things. You're not the boss of me. You're, you're a servant. But you know, when we, when we accept Christ and we accept the right foundation, we build a foundation that allows you, even if you have lousy relationships with somebody, it allows you to improve them at least to see things through a different window. And it quits eating you from the inside. The old scripture, or the old phrase I say a lot is that bitterness is like a poison that you drink and expect you to kill your neighbor. But you know, that, that's not how it works. Faith will help us to get by those kind of things. It also tells us as we become believers, we focus on the things that Jesus taught us. And the banners that we have here at church are, that are three very simple things. What are we supposed to do? We're supposed to love God. We're supposed to love others. And we're supposed to serve both. Pretty simple. But that, in essence, is the gospel kind of in our language. Now, the other part is that even if you have some of those ugly Fridays, it doesn't extinguish your joy and peace if you're a believer. I'm not saying you don't have some bad days, right? No bad days. I'm not saying that's not going to be what it is. But what happens is, is it doesn't take us long and we wrestle with that and we grasp it and we say, you know what? I'm going to have joy and peace regardless because I know my Savior lives. I know who I am in Him and I don't have to look for somebody else for approval because my approval's in Christ. 
So if you haven't truly made Jesus Lord of your life, I pray you do that today. Because the reality is, if you haven't, this is your time. Okay? I haven't spotted everybody, but let me... So Eric is right here. Stand up, would you? Dan, where are you at? Dan in here, and he, he's probably out in the deal. Uh, but Dan, you saw, that was at the baptistry uh, in the first baptism. is Dennis, he may be in the overflow too. Dennis, okay? And Justin is in the back, okay? So let me tell you this. If you realize that you are, your relationship with your Savior is not where it needs to be, or maybe you don't have a relationship with him, then go search out one of those guys or me and have that conversation. Because this is your time. This is the time, this resurrection day is a time that we can literally have real change in our life. And then we have all this great stuff, all these rewards that happen to us as a result of us. You guys can sit down. I had enough of you. Now, the praise team's going to come in a minute, but I'm going to pray in just a minute. But uh, I'm going to do what they've threatened me not to do, okay? But we're going to sing a song, but I think it's a great song. I've sung it all week in my head. I haven't really sang it out loud, so I'm not probably going to sing it very much. But I love the song. It's, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Remember that song? And when we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Bow your heads with me as praise team comes. Father, we thank you for the day you've given us. We thank you for resurrection. I can't say that loud enough, Father, because uh, we, we so often take uh, your son's death and resurrection for granted. I ask you, Lord, that for all of us that we contemplated where our faith is. Is it still in my head or is it in my heart? If it's in my heart, Lord, help me to live, live for you. If I've got stuff I need to clean up, Lord, help me clean it up. Because, Father, I want to, I want to be a walking, talking vessel serving you here on this earth until you call me home. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for listening to the Freedom Fellowship audio podcast. We are located at 990 West Henry de Tonti Boulevard in Tonti Town, Arkansas. You can check us out on the web at freedomfellowship.com or you can find us on social media by searching Freedom Fellowship NWA. We hope you have a great week and that you live out the mission of the church which is to love God, love others, and serve both.